So there was some interest on stream about doing a kind of like a discussion about the classic AMA. And uh, that's what we're going to do. Give the people what they want. Um, one thing I have to say is thanks a lot to Wowhead for compiling all this. I don't really know how they did it because I was trying to read all of these on uh, Reddit itself. And it's a mess. I, I, there, there should be a way to search by just a poster, but I don't know it. So anyway, um, yeah, a good a couple hours here. <clears throat> I think they actually went longer than they expected to. And they asked a lot of questions, answered a lot of questions. So we're going to read every single one of them. Okay. Uh, what are your plans for server reset days for Classic? The raid reset points have been restored to original 112 values. Classic operates as part of our gen uh, general World of Warcraft infrastructure. So it's the same, basically. Long story short, no difference uh, from live. Uh, don't forget, a lot of raids don't actually reset on Tuesday. Uh, there's a lot of that in Classic. So I don't know what that's going to do to the game, but I don't think it's going to really matter. Anyway, Dungeons. What is the intended player cap of Dungeons in Classic? Wow. Uh, this is indeed a bug that wait, what? this is indeed a bug that we have fixed, and you should be able to enter most low-level dungeons with up to ten players, as was possible in original WoW 1.12. There are some dungeons that had specific caps by the end of original WoW. To be specific, all lower-level dungeons available through Maradon should have a player cap of ten, with Blackrock Skull, uh, Blackrock Depth, Skull Man, Stratholm, and Darmal being capped at five. Oh, I had no idea that that's the case. You could do a ten uh, ten player. Meridon. What the hell? That's news to me. I had no idea. Honor calculations. How does that work with honor calculations? They were always done in downtime. <clears throat> when restoring the honor calculation code, we rewrote it so we can work while the game is live. Realms do not need downtime for honor to update. I had, again, no idea that it was always done in downtime, so that's great. Guard spawns. Did guards, uh, did guard spawns really work the same back in vanilla as they do in retail? I'm honestly not sure we looked at that specific case. Thanks for the detailed description. We'll take a look and make sure we get it right. Okay, something wrong with guards, I guess. Had no idea. Never experienced it. <clears throat> debuff priority. Will there be a debuff priority system in place to ensure important debuffs stay on targets and aren't overwritten by things like deep wounds? Uh, there's a debuff priority system in vanilla, and we replicated it. The issue with ranged and arcane missiles was fixed by 1.12, and we kept that fix. I'm not sure what that's... I guess I'm not reading the full question. Most of this is just uh, paraphrasing. But, yeah, obviously, uh, I think a lot of these questions are going to be like, oh, yeah, we're just doing exactly what it was like in live. Um, transferring gold between live and classic. Uh, this is actually something I brought up on stream. What is the stance that people trading gold from classic realms for gold on BFA realms and vice versa? <clears throat> There's no direct means for characters in BFA to transfer gold to characters in WoW Classic. This would be highly disruptive for classic as the economy, economies of two games are very different. Gold exchange between player and WoW is subject to our terms of service. Purchase of gold from third parties could lead to suspension or banning of accounts. So we actually talked about this on stream. Um, yeah, I definitely think there needed to be a WoW token, and I think it's going to be a massive issue that there isn't one. Uh, this is something more specific, I guess, about people like agreeing to trade between themselves. That's fine. I'm pretty sure you can do that. So, uh, But I guess it's not really something that should happen, but I guess it's, it can. Like if somebody had a lot of money on Classic and they didn't want to play Classic anymore, and somebody had a lot of money on Live and they didn't want to play Live anymore, they could literally just swap golds, and maybe that's fine. I guess it's fine. Anyway, holidays. As this and other holiday events are quite soon, can we expect it being live with old functionalities? Rick or treat? Yes. Uh, because we're based on patch 112's data, holidays will play out as they did during that patch. So we look forward to spooky treats and happy haunts this October. Oh, yeah, that's true. October's like mad close, huh? So that's good. Anyway, reporting. This is a great one. Okay, glad to hear this question. Uh, hi, how are you going to deal with gold sellers and cheaters? WoW Classic has much better means for detection than original WoW. Uh, all WoW players are subject to a terms of service. Violation could result. And that, that can't be the answer, surely. Surely there's more to it. I guess I maybe should be looking... That's literally what it said. Executive producer, Altrius Wow. Well, that's a shame. I was definitely hoping for a more specific answer than that. But um, I guess his point is, is that compared to the old game, uh, the original classic, it's going to be a lot easier to catch people who cheat. But you say that. <laughs> anyway, uh, loot and phases. Okay, loot. In phase one, will the raid only drop items added to Molten Core before patch 1.3? In phase two, will it only drop items added to Molten Core before 1.5? Or will we have the 112 vanilla molten core loot tail from the start? This is a great question. Uh, let's see. For me, some of the fun of clearing a dungeon is discovering loot as you go. But for those who want more information, the drop tables are mostly from 112. There is a significant uh, exception to that in phase 5 when relics are added to drop tables. Uh, when they were originally added in patch 110, they affect the drop tables significantly enough that simply removing relics from the drop table until, uh, until phase 5 wouldn't be sufficient. It would have had effects on drop rates of other items that we didn't feel were acceptable or authentic. So for that specific change to item drops, we did reproduce the boss drop table from the previous patch. Oh. 
Before phase five, the affected bosses have one nine uh, drop tables, and once phase five hits, they'll use one ten. So they're talking about only percentages. Or are they talking about the actual gear is going to be different? That change doesn't affect MC or Ani very heavily, so you should expect those drops at launch to stay uh, very to in a state very similar to the final stage six eight. Again, I don't want to give it all away, so I'll leave a bit to exploration and discovery. I don't think so, man. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's good. I don't know what that means exactly, but as long as, because, you know, if you played a private server from the day it launched and they do that, like replicating um, the, the progression. <clears throat> Sorry, I just ate. I try never to make a video after I eat, but I had to. Um, anyway, yes, uh, they try to replicate the actual item, uh, the, like the gear stats as well. So, like, if you did MC and got Druid Legs in phase one it would have arcane and nature damage on it <laughs> which is obviously not great i actually had that happen to me on the starius um i drew it um got those and then eventually they become a much better piece in not too long ago so not too long later but i guess that's not what they're doing anyway loot two uh, could you specify a little about how you handle quest hubs like throwing pult siltus zinthalor and as well as other later phase quests which would be available from the beginning of phase one and will, which will come later um, we want there to be some exploration and discovery to this, so I can't dig super deep into exact specifics about individual quests, items, or reps. Item rep items will be available. <clears throat> Painting and broad strokes, however, throwing point into the lower quest should be available during phase one. Most quests in scenario and hold will be available during phase five, along with AQ gate open. Yeah, what, what's even in that zone? If there's no, I I don't. I've never actually done AQ before that, so I don't know anything about it. Anyway, the general methodology was to make quest recipes, items, and the like available when it makes sense to do so. I'm, I'm definitely not like in this vibe where they're like, "Oh, you got, we gotta wait and see, dude. It's classic. You gotta find it out on your own." <laughs> what the fuck? Just answer the goddamn question if you're gonna answer it. But uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's fair. Um, I don't know. Too too general for me to have much in input on. Okay, loot three. Please clarify whether this means drop percentage or an axiomal. Oh, they were perfect. Uh, changing mage blade drop percentage when more items get added to the table isn't that big of a deal. Changing whether binding drops in phase one is entirely different. They're related. Imagine a drop table that has two items that each has a 50% chance to drop. If you're restricted so one of these can't drop, the other one just becomes a 100% chance to drop, or you have to have a 50% chance to drop nothing. There are various items throughout the game that were added later and which we restricted to later phases, but we took a careful look at any of these items we decided to restrict to make sure it didn't affect the drop rates of other items too much. If it did, we went back and pulled an earlier version of the drop table so it would have an appropriate loot distribution, and the biggest of these changes was in Phase 5. That said, none of the drop uh, table changes occur between Phase 1 and 2. They're all in later phases, so yes, bindings can drop in Phase 1. Good luck getting pulled of them. So that, again, doesn't really... Just very, not very specific, right? But I, don't, I guess there was never gear removed. I'm not, I thought there might be. Like, I was expecting that to be the case, that there was some gear removed from the game throughout the classic uh, expansion progression. But if that's not the case, then I guess the question that I would be asking is irrelevant. So we'll just assume that's the case and move on. Items added in later patch. This seems to contradict Ian Hazakos' tweet from a while back that suggested that 1-4 items like Obsidian Edge Blade would be introduced in Phase 2. Yes, items like Obsidian Edge Blade will be in during Phase 1. This is due to a related discussion to not bring back the original item stats because it would have felt really weird if an item stats changed while you were wearing it. So that's what I was just talking about. We think it would feel weird to drop Tier 2 items with their 112 item stats in Molten Core. Wait, so they're not? So Tier 2 Helmet, or what is it, Tier 2 Legs is not coming from Ragnarok? Oh, except the Tier 2 Pants from Ragnarok, of course. Wait, what? I didn't know that tier two items dropped in MC ever. I don't know. Okay, anyway, ketchup gear. You're releasing ketchup gear released in 110 at the same time as the original pre DM loot tables. The ketchup gear added in 110 won't be available until phase five. The MC tables weren't affected very much by the 110 changes. Almost all their loot was in uh, the same from 15 to 112. So the changes you see to MC throughout our content unlocks will be very minor. Okay. Everybody's focusing on minor, on, um, Phase one, I'd really wish they would focus on like halfway through the expansion, but whatever. Okay, here we go. After phase six, what are the plans after phase six? We've done most of the hard work by bringing back 112, so progressing to Burning Crusade would be a lot easier for us. Oh, not really though, right? <laughs> that's a lot. That's a fucking bold statement to say. Anyway, our plan is to identify everything we need to do should we ever decide to go this route. We want to be sensitive to the desires of our players. Some may want BC and some may not. 
uh, we'll be following the classic community closely to help determine what our next step should be. Yeah, hopefully the next step is definitely classic or uh, definitely TBC because otherwise this shit is going to have a hell of a shelf life. But I would love to see um, kind of like your characters get copied to TBC, not just they're the same characters and classic's gone. That'd be cool if like <clears throat> you could like basically copy a classic character into TBC and classic remains that uh, that same experience if that's what you want. But anyway, that's like at least probably two and a half years away. Layering and population, clearing up misconceptions. I think this is generally some misunderstanding within the community and how and why the layering technique works in classic. So this is a really long question. Let's get through it. Um, but a lot of it is kind of just fluff. Um, but I'm going to read every word. I'm so glad you asked this question. We've seen some confusion about layering, both about how it support it helps support at launch and how it's supposed to behave while it's active. Uh, so I'd like to speak to it and clear up some misconceptions about it. Uh, first, we're absolutely committed to reducing to one layer per realm before our second content phase goes live, and the sooner we can get there, the better. The reason we can't do this initially is that on launch day, everybody will be clustered in the starting zones, and having players so close together causes an exponential drain on server resources. In fact, the same number of players cause more server problems crammed into Northshire than they do spread across all of Elwyn Forest. And I think that has something to do with range finding. I was looking up, uh, I was looking into this um, for uh, actually other games, and I kind of stumbled across it for WoW. But basically, any type of like ranged ability, like aura, like um, a ret aura, that's supposed to go to other people, it constantly has to check that. So if there's six thousand people all within twenty yards of your character, and it's checking whether or not they can get red aura, that's a lot of extra. You know, if, if they were just if there were six thousand people all thirty yards away from you, it would be a lot better. I'm not exactly sure if it works like that for a while, but that's how it works in other games. <clears throat> We expect that even after the first couple of days, we'll need fewer layers than what we needed for initial launch hours. And our stress tests have confirmed that expectation. So that makes me think, like, what what's the cue for then? You know what I mean? And he doesn't really answer this. Uh, he doesn't answer my concern here. A relating concern that was raised during our pre-launch test was the capital cities felt empty. But that only occurred because we left pre-launch test running two days past its original end date. And we didn't reduce the numbers of layers at all during that test. Uh, during our launch week, as the players spread out across the world, we'll monitor activity and reduce layers as necessary so the world continues to feel full. I mean, if you have a queue and the world doesn't feel full, then we have something seriously wrong. So I don't know what they're doing. But anyway, some players have suggested using sharding and low-level zones to address launch demands, which is different than layering, by the way. Uh, both because we talked about that at BlizzCon and because it's what they're used to from modern expansions. Unfortunately, while Modern WoW has content designed to work with sharding, Classic does not. The most obvious example of incompatible content is Rexar's famously long patrol path. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. But there are lots of other examples throughout Classic. Uh, since we want all that content to work as it was originally designed, we've made sure that each layer is a copy of the entire world. So you can kite Anachronos all the way to Orgrimmar, and you, cannot ride, or, and you can ride the boat from Ratchet to Booty Bay with the same people alongside you the way. So basically what they're talking about is things that expand across a single, not uh, across multiple zones. It wouldn't work with sharding, so they can't do that. Uh, some players have asked us to use realm caps and login queues to handle the demand. That's that's what you are doing. And while those are tools we have at our disposal, we don't want to rely on them exclusively because they keep people from playing the game. Let's find out about that. Anyway, one of the most frequently uh, reported problems during our test was players transferring to a lair for what seemed like no reason. Uh, there were several bugs that caused this, and we're confident we fixed them. At this point, the only thing that should cause you to change layers is accepting an invite from a player on another layer. Additionally, it should always transfer the player who was invited to the layer of the player who invited them. I mean, that doesn't even work that way on live. So, <laughs> oh boy, I hope I hope they're I hope they're right um, because that would obviously be a problem for classic. But anyway, nonetheless, after accepting an invite, the layer transfer doesn't always happen immediately because we don't want to transfer you in the middle of combat or before you get a chance to loot. During our pre-launch test, we saw a few reports of what seemed like random layer transfers, but when we investigated, we realized that this was us. Uh, wait. Due to us making that transfer delay too long, the delay was so long that players could unintentionally chain one delay into another. That's the video I saw. Because of these reports, we fixed the transfer delay to give you enough time to loot without being so long that you're left wondering why you can't join your friend. This actually, I saw a video of this. Somebody joined a group to do a quest. They got like 70% of the way through the quest, and then they got layer changed or whatever you'd call it. And I guess that was because they kept entering combat over and over again without enough time in between that they never phased apart or together or whatever. So that's interesting. Anyway, um, okay. Uh, we've also seen reports of people transferring suddenly at the entrances to capital cities. 
uh, which was related to the transfer delays. If you're waiting to transfer to your friend's lair and you enter a capital city, we ignore the delay and transfer you immediately. The long delays were making it more likely than you that you'd enter a capital with a transfer pending, and now that we've reduced the transfer delay, it will be a bit more clear that your transfer was the result of accepting a group invitation. Regarding PvP, we saw many posts about players wondering if getting to invited to a party is a good way to escape from PvP combat. I'm pleased to say that there's actually a separate, longer transfer delay following any PvP content. We know a lot of world PvP enthusiasts are excited for WoW Classic, and we don't want the additional layers to feel like you're, they're robbing you of kills. When the time comes to withdraw from the fight, you'll have to escape from your enemies and get to a safe place before you're able to join your friends on another layer. I guess that's the right way to do it, uh, surely. Uh, definitely better than how it is on live, where you can literally just leave in the middle of combat. Uh, I'd also like to clarify how multiple layers works with logout. Early in our stress testing, players reported that logging out and back in would let you hop to a new layer to farm the same material. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, this was a bug and we fixed it. Your layer assignment now persists for a few minutes between logouts. Long enough that by the time the game would choose a new layer for you, the node would have respawned on its own anyway. Are you sure about that? That's a, that, It's that long? Because I'm pretty sure nodes take like up to 30 minutes to respawn in Classic, don't they? But anyway. Okay. Uh, phase 2 overpopulation. Here we go. What are the plans for Phase 2 if some realms are horrifically overpopulated at 50k plus players? Uh, will layering stay? We're absolutely committed to reaching one layer per realm by phase two. This is why we need to have upper bounds on the numbers of players connected to the realm at one time and queue players uh, past that point. That, of course, is why we're willing to open new servers if necessary, and we've even started doing that in response to the incredibly positive reception we had during the name reservation period. I mean, if you open new servers in the middle, like a couple weeks, if we're talking about phase two, that's probably months, a couple months away. If they open new servers at phase two, nobody's going to play on them, right? Like, who's going to start over? Unless it's literally just two straight months of them not even be able to log in. This is, like, such a stupid problem that we're even having this. You know what I mean? They should have just used the realm tech they have from live and made one mega server connected. And that's that's all they should have did, man. And I know people don't want to hear that, but, like, this is a problem that shouldn't exist. This is a problem that is only existing... Because we're insisting on a time machine instead of a functioning, a fully functioning game. You know what I mean? It'd be like, oh, I want to use a cell phone again, but I got to get a flip phone that doesn't have internet. So I'm not going to be able to use the internet on it. It's like, just use what's there and just forget that you don't live in 2004 anymore. You know what I mean? It's just so sad. But I am telling you right now, man, if at any point we go from having no problem getting in to a point where there's like a thousand plus queue every night, I'm done. Like, I I'm not going to sit in queue. When there was no queue, like this is a terrible, terrible solution, and frankly, this whole, this whole like um, sharding or whatever, no, not, layering is is fine. It works fine. Just keep it as long as it's needed. You know what I mean? If 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 there's like, oh no, phase two launches, that's it. Now you have to sit in a 10k queue on these big realms. I don't know, man. Oh, here we go. Oh, of course. <laughs> what exactly are the pop caps for a layer? We're not releasing specific numbers. Of course, you're fucking not. Uh, that will likely change dramatically. Uh, based on the response we got from name reservations, we're anticipating large player populations for some realms initially. This may change as players switch to lower population realms. We'll use layers to help provide or help improve performance in the short term if large groups of players cluster in an area. We hope to reduce the use of layering over time as people spread out in each realm. See, like, these are such... I don't know, man. As much as I love Blizzard, like, these kind of answers are just... Don't even, a don't a even answer the question. You know what I mean? Don't answer the fucking question. If you're going to say, oh, we can't answer that, but here's some overly generic thing that we're going to say to try to make you forget that we can't answer that. Because that's what this is, right? What exactly are the pop... Unless this is not the question, and it's just paraphrased terribly. That's not a... Uh... Oh, and extrapolating from that, what are the server pop thresholds roughly in indicating? Okay, so I guess it's a little bit more complicated than I originally thought. But it's like, uh, I don't know, man. And actually, yeah, this guy points out that the guy says something that's uh, contradictory to what layering is supposed to be. I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of this this whole rigmarole they're going through to try to make Classic feel like it's 2004 again. I wish they would just use modern tech and the content was all people cared about. But anyway, free realm transfers. We offer free realm transfers if servers get way overpopulated after launch. This is, this is actually the one that I saw on the stream today. This is definitely one of the options we are considering, but for now we are encouraging players to use name reservation period to transfer their character to lower population realms. So it's, I thought it was the other way around. I thought they were saying free RAM transfers if servers get way too dead. It's so weird. Am I the only person who cares about dead realms? 
Like, I feel like I'm literally the only person. Everybody else is talking about cues for three weeks. And then all of a sudden, the realms are... I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe there's never going to be dead realms. Maybe there's this many people. And uh, the start is going to be a mess. But I don't, I, I'm don't. i very worried about this. So, Anyway, paid character transfer. Will paid character transfers also be a thing? Should a server drop heavily in population and a player wishes to find more activity or reconvene with friends on another server? Okay. That's a good question. Um, we're considering integrating a character service transfer, a transfer service once players have reached high levels. This was available in original WoW, and we look at the rules we imposed at that time and also discuss the implications of players moving to a new realm. We believe realm identity is an important aspect of Classic, so any guidelines around transfer should support this belief. See, this is the oxymoronic scenario here, right? I don't know if that's even a word, but... Um, this is actually um, one of the big problems with Classic, right? You can't have it both ways. One way or the other, you're going to do something not blizz like quote-unquote, like you would have said on private servers. You're either going to have ridiculous queues with dead realms at the end. You're going to have cross-realm technology, which is obviously not going to happen. Or, the third thing, you're going to have server transfers. One way, You cannot avoid it. It's going to happen one way or the other. There's no new, probably, anyway, maybe there will be, but very, very unlikely that there's going to be anything new to bring people back to Classic. If they've quit, they're probably not returning, right? So, if there's, say, somehow 50,000 people on one server, day one, and there's 10k people in the queue. So then down the road, 10k people uh, quit, and now there's you know 50k people on the server. That's good, but eventually it's going to get to a point where there's just less and less and less by the day, and this causes this dead realm phenomena. But I do hope that this a big problem with this on private servers was that people would constantly slash who. They'd be like, oh my god, there's 30 less people online right now. The server's dead. So that will be one of the things. I do wish they would tell us how many people were allowed on each server. But the fact that they're not should help with this a little bit. Because this was a huge problem on private servers, man. It's unbelievable. People would be like, oh, there was 2K people on yesterday. Now there's only 1K. That's it for the server. It was like, okay. I mean, and then people would literally leave the server. Like, stop playing the game because of that. So, it's going to happen again. It's not a, this is not an observation. It's a fact. You know what I mean? It will happen. And I just don't know when. Obviously, nobody does. But... When that happens, what do you do? When you have 15 realms and only 10 of them can support proper communities, what happens to the other five? And that will happen eventually. So whether or not maybe that's even six years from now, who knows? But sometime you're going to have to address this. And uh, I, I guess not committing to that is probably not um, not surprising, but it would be nice to know that they have some kind of a creative idea in play. Anyway, no boost. I hope the character servers stay limited to server transfers. <laughs> Why would you even ask this? Obviously, they're not going to have character boosts in Classic. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, that's not going to happen. Anyway, other character services. We aren't considering other services beyond character transfer, like re uh, character rename. That's one of the things that I, you know, obviously, um, I never really use in Livewell, but I know a lot of people use it to kind of get, a, get away. You know what I'm saying? Like change, make a change, but you can't do that in Classic. Okay, anyway, summary. We've answered these questions in more details on other posts. I'll try to summarize answers for you based on the name reservations we've seen. The queue time in some realms will be extremely long. We've opened some additional. We opened up additional realms, and we're encouraging people to set up their characters on lower population realms for a better experience. This is a good time to coordinate with your friends' guilds to switch if they reserve name on a full realm. We're also considering integrating character service transfers later, when players have high level characters. Yeah. So by by when later on is the key thing, not like when you get sixty, then you could transfer. Which I think I wouldn't be. That would actually be fine too. If once you get a 60, you could transfer. Or maybe once you get two 60s. That would be an interesting thing. Prove that you've leveled and you've experienced the realm enough and now you just you deserve to leave it. I don't know. Anyway, no change. Hashtag no changes. Of course, gates of AQ. For the gate uh, of AQ event, you guys are keeping the resources and amounts the same for turn-ins or can we expect you to have a few tricks up your sleeve to prevent stockpiling? stockpiling? Hashtag no changes. In all seriousness, one of our core pillars is to recreate the original experiences as authentically as possible, but you can't do that if... So this is why this whole thing is just a joke. Anyway, this will extend to the required resources for the AQ War event. We realize there's nothing uh, we can do to unwind the knowledge gained over the years. Well, okay, I'm glad you admit that. Uh, what we have do, what we do, wait, what we do have control over is ensuring that World of Warcraft Classic matches as closely as. So that's that's like I feel like them saying that is like, hey, this is what you asked for. This is what you're getting, by the way. Like I think that that's it, right? You can't say this seriously and be like, oh, this is the right way to make the game. The game is going to be played differently because of this experience and this knowledge. 
it's going to be considerably easier. So sure, you not changing anything to make it as easy, like, you know, to make it even easier, you're just killing the, the own, your own game, right? Like, I don't know what's going to actually happen with the AQ War event because it was just a joke on private servers. But we'll see, I guess. It's so, so long. I, I barely care at this point. Hunter Trap spell batching seems to have caused problems with AoE abilities, such as people being able to run over Hunter Traps and it not going off, or running through Mage Blizzard spells and not getting hit or slowed by it and many other AoE abilities. Are there any thoughts about lowering the spell batching delay or another way to fix these issues? Yeah, that's yeah. This is not actually related to spell batching. Traps and AOE abilities check for presence on targets during a heartbeat update. If the targets move through them between two heartbeat updates, they will not notice the target. This is how it was originally. <laughs> oh my, yo, make the goddamn game to be the best it can be, dude. Why do this nonsense? If this is actually the case, are you joking? Run over a hundred traps and it not going off. This is intended. Oh my god, dude. I hope that's just some extremely small chance that this kind of thing could happen. It's like one out of a billion people might see it. This is really worrying, man. Like, what? I feel like they're literally just trolling the fan base at this point. They're like, no, hey, hey, you said no changes. Oh, this is what you're getting. I mean, first of all, I don't think I've ever seen this happen on a private server. So I don't know if it happened there or not. But could you imagine this running through Blizzard and not being slowed? Is that going to work on five mans and shit? Like mobs that slow you, you can just swoop, swoop. Oh, I got through the ability. It didn't go off. What are you talking about? But anyway, it's definitely not related to batching. It's stupid that this person even thought it, it was because batching was tuned down instead of up, right? Anyway, on Nixia, on certain private servers, I'm sure how this worked back in the day, you would only get locked to a Nixia ID if you were inside the instance when she died. This meant 30 people could hearth out when... Really? What the hell? Okay, that's obviously a bug. That's definitely not how it's supposed to work. This is not possible in Classic. All players who are instanced when Anixia is engaged will be locked. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> That's just really stupid. Uh, will Mankirk's wife be moved to recreate authentic vanilla experience? What do you mean moved? Why would it be any different than it was in Classic? Anyway, Leashing and Kazakh. Uh, the only thing I want to know is, can we still pour, pull Lord Kazakh to Stormwind? Kazakh had a hard leash in 112, but other bosses in the world that... Oh, I see. So they actually changed this because they knew what destruction Kazakh would uh, would incur. This was actually changed in Classic, though. So Again, there's going to be a lot of things that people think were Classic, but were changed in 112 as well. Anyway, World Buffs. How are you going to handle World... Oh, the best question. This is great. I can tackle... Let's, let's make sure we're reading the actual source here, because this is a really important question. Oh, that's a lot of... Uh... He's only answering the World Buff part, though. Okay. Um, so how does your team plan to address the deficiencies? Okay, that's not it. How are you going to handle world buffs? Are they going to be enabled at launch on of each 40-man raid? Or will they be disabled for a length of time to make the raid more difficult? Okay, so that's the actual question. I can tackle the question related to world buffs. World buffs are going to function exactly as they did in 112, which is to say that they will remain available and will not be restricted when new phases are rolled out. Rallying Cry of the Dragon Slayer will have a cooldown. You will need to wait for the current Onyxia or Nefarian head to despawn. Oh, that's not how it was on private servers, right? So that's bugged. That was bugged on private servers, I guess. You could get the buff over and over again if you want to. Um, but still, the other ones don't work like that. That's only that one that works like that, which is one of the most important ones, right? So you're gonna, you, know, you can't even get Ani and Nef at the same time anymore, then that's what that means. Can you do that on private servers? Probably. Well, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is by the way, in case you guys are new or for some reason you don't know anything about world buffs, uh, they pretty much trivialize raids. They're like a high risk, high reward thing though. Like if you die, they're gone, 99% of them, I think. But between consumables and world buffs, your character basically like triples in power. So it'd be like, imagine like doing a world quest that gave you a buff, like maybe like a world quest in Nashitar that you, uh, you ride the turtle, <laughs> you know, that turtle shell ride in Nashitar. Imagine if you could just take that into a dungeon. It's like, oh, yeah, no, that's fine. That's basically how it works in a classic. There's things that give you things that probably aren't meant to be used in competitive content, quote unquote, competitive content, but they work that way because it's classic. So like if that same thing was in live, wow, I'm saying it wouldn't work. Let's put it that way. Anyway, hashtag some changes. Skeletons. Will the skeletons that appear when someone dies be the same as it was originally? Right now they disappear when you die again. They used to stay longer than that. Thanks for the great question. While we understand this is a flavorful part of original WoW and the early expansions, individual players leaving multiple corpses and skeletons throughout the game world can lead to behavior such as spelling out advertising, 
Oh, I forgot about this. Yeah. Huh. As such, this will not be part of WoW classes. Hashtag some changes. Anyway, launch. Pre-launch restarts. Will servers be brought down at some point before release, or will players be able to sit at character select waiting for Enter World to activate? Oh, that's a great question. We are likely to perform some kind of realm restarts or maintenance between now and launch. However, in the minutes leading up to launch, our plans is that the realms will be up and available, and the Enter button will be instantly light up once we launched. That's good to hear. So I'll definitely probably start the stream about maybe an hour early, a half hour early. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Anyway, queue times. Can you elaborate in any way on some of the expected queue lengths, preferably in length of time at launch? I mean, length of time they can't elaborate on, right? How could they suggest that? On the most popular servers, such as Herod and Shazra, we are currently ex estimating lengthy queue times, up to several hours or more in certain instances. This is why we strongly encourage players to use the name reservation period to transfer their character and their guilds to lower pop realms. Several hours. I mean, do we mean eight? <laughs> Two hours was the most I ever saw on Classic um, private server. It was a 14,000 Q the day Elysium launched. The the new Elysium, like the fresh Elysium, not the Nostarius relaunch. There was, I think there was 22K on. No, I think they lowered, they had lowered it significantly. Eventually it went up to over 20K. Originally it was like probably like 12k and then 14k in the queue. So it was like 40. It was about 40,000 people trying to log on. Let's put it that way. Anyway, queue times number two. Uh, is that on launch phase patch day only or do you expect lengthy queues during regular weekdays after the first as well? Uh, this is something we are definitely keeping an eye on and making adjustments as needed due to all the excitement. We are expecting lengthy queues for at least the first week after launch. But hopefully once people get out of the instance, like or the, the, um, the starting zones, they could increase the pop cap. I don't know how they're going to do it. And I have zero, uh, zero, what do I call it? I don't know. I, I have very little faith in them doing it. So we'll see. Anyway, launch experience improvements. What steps are being taken to ensure that at launch, the same thing doesn't happen on an even grander scale during the initial rush? What is this? Oh, okay. On August 12th, the classic servers in place were buckled nearly to the point of breaking under the weight of character creation alone. Many players showed up early, only to be randomly lagged out and disconnected, held back sometimes 30 minutes or more, and potentially missing the chance for their reserved names. What steps are being taken to ensure that at launch the same thing doesn't happen on an even grander scale? Are there measures in place to avoid punishing those that randomly get disconnected? Okay, so that was the question. The answer, apparently, is only answering one part. We're planning a number of fixes to improve that experience. First, we're already begun opening new realms, and we encourage people to switch to them. We've also increased the size of realm queues. So that I can hold more people before disconnecting them. Hmm. And we've improved the error message you get so that you know you're being disconnected because the queue is full. Wait, there's a full queue? What? Is that a joke? What are you talking about? There's, there's like a possibility that there would be so many people in queue that you can't be in queue either. Wow, they... Anyway, emergency realms. You have a contingency plan to deal with larger than expected population. We have contingency plans in place to bring up additional realms quickly if needed. We can also integrate character transfers. Uh, this ultimately became a service in original WoW. As you can imagine, it's difficult for us to gauge how many people will come to play Classic. Will it? Will it be difficult? And stay on to experience max level content. That, okay, I should have kept reading. <laughs> I should have kept reading because that's the important part. Anyway, ultimately, we want to see realms with healthy, stable populations. So we'll try to match demands with inadv without inadvertently creating low population realms in the process. It's good to hear them say it, at least, because that's the biggest problem that this game will face. So that's good. Emergency realms number two. What will you do if all the realms are capped out at launch day with massive queues? Will you continually put up realms with the demand is met? Um, we have contingency plans in place to bring up additional realms quickly if needed. We took a careful approach here. Taking various things into consideration, we wanted to hold true to our main objective of ensuring healthy realms communities past a uh, post-launch world. Therefore, we felt that the best approach here was to start off with fewer realms in order to gauge player interest during the name reservation period. As we have seen players congregate on certain types of realms, we have opened up new realms with communication to that effect. While we acknowledge that queues will be a lot part of launch experience, we encourage players to keep an eye on the forums and message boards over the next few days and weeks for communication around realms with lower populations and therefore more manageable queue times. So yeah, basically, again, no answer. Same same stuff that they've been saying. System requirements. Will we see DX12 and Classic and the multi-threaded utilization elements at some point? If not, is there a technical limitation? We're not planning to bring DX12 and the multi-threaded enhancements to Classic Client. The multi-threaded support greatly improves performance on a large-scale environment like Suramora or Boralus. Classic worlds and models are much simpler. It would also increase the system requirements. So they're saying they don't need it? Is that is that really a reason to not bring it in? I guess 
they also are saying that it would increase the system requirements. You don't have to use DX12, right? I'm not using it. But anyway, uh, miscellaneous says the reception of classic met or exceeded expectations. Are there four more people coming back for classic than expected? Or were you guys right about the predicted ballpark? <laughs> Why would you even ask this? Uh, we have been blown away by the response to classic. The passion from the community is exactly what got us working on this in the first place. And we see new signs of your passion and excitement every day. We're very excited to make it a reality for all of you next week. Sweet. Oh, I should have asked about the add on. I knew I wanted to ask a question in this. Anyway, y'all are doing such a great job. Thanks for all the hard work to bring something so special to us again the way we remember it. Uh, thanks. You've got an awesome team here and that is helpful. Uh, that is helping to make all this possible and we couldn't have wished for... Okay, who cares? Uh, what, success do, what does success look like for the classic WoW dev team? Success for us is that players enjoy the game. We hope that those who played back in the day are overcome with nostalgia, great memories, and reconnect with old friends. We hope that new players get to experience this iconic time in MMO history and experience the world with new friends. This is definitely probably the biggest thing that's ever happened in while in an MMO in MMO history for sure. This launching is probably the biggest event that's ever occurred. And uh, let's hope they do it right, man. That's all I could say. During the development of Classic, did you stumble over any Easter eggs or secrets that the community never discovered? When we were going through the original source code, we uncovered a few inline developer comments. It was super interesting to read them, like messages from the past. One of the most colorful comments I enjoyed was a reference to adding spells. Whatever you do, don't get them wet. Funny guy. Anyway, when creating Classic, was there anything specific your team thought was going to be incredibly hard to accomplish that turned out to be a lot easier than expected? One of the biggest benefits... How far are we along here? Almost done. One of the biggest benefits of having worked on World of Warcraft continuously since the beginning is that I have a strong grasp not only of how hard our game and server systems worked originally, but how they changed over time. The difference... So this is what I've been trying to allude to here. This is the complete opposite of what Classic was like originally. Classic launched with way less people than this. This is going to be like probably five times more people than played original Classic. So the problems that they're going to have here are flipped, right? The problems in Classic were that they needed to dramatically upscale as time went on. It's going to be the opposite. You know what I mean? I don't think they have the right... It sounds like they, they're they saying the right words. So that's good. At least they're saying the words. Sometimes Blizzard says the wrong words, even when they don't want to say anything. They still do something stupid. So um, hopefully the right words mean the right actions. But I don't think there's ever been a situation like this before in WoW's history. I, I really don't think there's there has been. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, uh, the process maintained a constant iteration comparing Classic to our 112 reference and making fixes and adjustments when we found differences. On a side note, I did find bits of old code that I wrote as a younger engineer. I fought hard to resist the urge to clean and refactor it in places it was not technically needed because at this point it's been production hearted for 10 plus years. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, anyway, when you went through some of the old code, did you find any work that really stood out and you couldn't believe what they achieved back in 2006? I found old code that stood out because I wrote it in 2005. What I am, oh, this, who is this? Who is saying this? I didn't know there was people who worked on this game this long. Senior software engineer, Ogron. I we never we don't know these people, right? Like these people are never they don't do Q and A's normally. They don't normally do this shit, you know. It's kind of crazy. What I am most impressed by is the longevity of our code base. We don't toss out old systems just to rebuild them again from scratch. That's probably the best and worst thing about Classic WoW, right? Or about WoW in general, not even Classic. We mostly take an evolutionary approach, which is to say we improve and extend systems as far as they can. When code systems do reach an overextended point. That's when we try and refactor, refactor our common components or pay down tech debt. What does that mean? On the engineering side, the technical decisions we make should be done in service of delivering great gaming experiences. This is like, these are not even people who, I, I can't even imagine these the job. These, these people work like 10 times harder than anybody else in the company, right? So, and their jobs are way more fucking important. <laughs> way more important. You know what I mean? If at any point they mess something up, that's that. You know what I mean? It's not Ian's fault that the game lags or something like that it's kind of crazy anyway hello what are some of the perks you guys had on uh, using legion game engines for classic we have vastly improved telemetry and telemetry and error reporting tools now that we had in 2006 as someone who fielded 3 a.m calls i consider this a huge perk as engineering only perk an engineering only perk is when we use modern compilers and debuggers which is a huge boost to productivity scalability security and robustness on the client front, our engine is much more efficient at rendering images and more stable and free of crashes in general. Yeah, so that's a good thing, obviously. 
Uh, what was the hardest thing to recreate? Hunters. Oh, wow. They were one of the most complicated classes in vanilla, and we had to do a huge amount of work to restoring them. That's an interesting. How about that? Hunters. Of all things to say, that's interesting. What are some interesting hiccups or bugs you guys hit in redeveloping vanilla? There's a bug when two priests mind control each other that the uh, that the mind controls itself would cancel out, but the Karen would still switch to each other. The result is both priests would be stuck waiting on each other move watching each other move around, which is hilarious and very confusing. Wow. <laughs> Stuff like that I'm glad I'm reading about. Hunter and Warlock pets take an absurd amount of time to respond to commands. Can you please acknowledge it and tell us when it will be fixed? Okay, interesting. We I didn't know any of this. We fixed several... I mean, to be fair, <laughs> if you play private servers, this is not going to be the first time you had this. I mean, literally, on some private servers, hunters just didn't use a pet because it wasn't worth it. It was going to cause more problems than it was worth. But hopefully that's not going to be the case here. We fixed several bugs with pet commands throughout Wild Classic Beta thanks to a ton of super detailed reports from the beta and stress test. As several posters have pointed out, we resolved many of the issues with pet responsiveness already. And I can confirm that several recent bugs have been brought have brought Hunter and Warlock pet responsiveness well in line with their behavior in the reference client. If any other issues pop up, we'll be uh, we will be quick to investigate them and take action as needed. Is that the end of it? Okay. Looking back at legacy code can be daunting. Did any of you run into code you wrote all those years ago? No, that was already answered. I absolutely did. The best part about it was being able to measure personal growth as an engineer by comparing how I might solve problems to how I solved them in the pet. That's fucking awesome, by the way. That is so cool. That must be so rewarding for these guys. I didn't know that there was people who actually worked on original classic or maybe not, maybe not classic. Maybe they're talking about like Legion code or something like things from like five years ago. Or so. I don't know. Maybe not though. Maybe they're actually talking about classic. Anyway, that's really cool, man. This was interesting. Um, most of the stuff that I would want to see asked and answered didn't really happen. And the main thing that I would want to hear about is a way like a contingency plan for dead realms, not the opposite. Everybody asked about the opposite which I think was a frivolous uh, a frivolous question, but it doesn't seem like they're interested in talking about anything other than this coming week here, which I am also disappointed with because I would have liked to hear more about the phases, or well, I'm sorry, the um, stages, what are they calling them? The seasons, I don't know. The things like group one, two, three, through six whatever those are called i've already forgotten but anyway i'm sure you'll correct me but anyway i would be interested more in hearing about those because right now we know almost nothing and uh yeah i guess they're just gonna wing it i don't know i'm really not interested in playing classic without dire mall let's put it that way without dire mall i have no reason really to play dire mall is like one of my favorite things to do besides content that i wouldn't easily be able to do so uh yeah we'll see and zogarub dire mall and zogarub those are my two favorite things in in game pv and classic so uh, if I get to 60 and Dire Maul's not out, and I'm like, actually like, you know, I've been 60 for a while, I'm geared, I can do Dire Maul, you know what I'm saying? And it's not out, I'll be disappointed, but anyway, that's that. So, hey, you know what? Uh, yeah, some interesting questions, some interesting answers. Um, I guess I'm getting more excited for Classic. Obviously, as the, the days get closer, uh, it's inevitable, but that's it. I'm sure you guys have some opinions, but this was, um, actually only took 40 minutes and so not too bad, but a question, uh, something people wanted me to do. So I'm glad I was able to do it for you guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.